好，各位来宾，欢迎出席由孟州古文教基金会赞助、香港中文大学新亚书院主办第七届新亚儒学讲座第一讲。讲者为现任美国宾夕法尼亚州立大学亚洲研究学系历史亚洲研究及宗教哲学教授武安祖教授。讲题为《儒家思想的综合展现：存在关怀与概念范畴》，以英语讲述。大家手上除了讲座的资料册以外，另一副呃一张问卷，请于讲座结束后把填好的问卷投进接待处的呃问卷收集箱。Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the first lecture of New Asia Lectures on Confucianism 2021, sponsored by the Meng Zhao Foundation and organized by New Asia College CUHK. It's our honor to have invited Professor Ng to be our speaker. Professor Ng is the professor of history, Asian studies, and philosophy at the Department of Asian Studies at the Pennsylvania State University. The topic today is a synthetic representation of Confucian thought, existential concerns, and conceptual vocabularies. The lecture will be conducted in English. Inside the booklet, which you have received, hopefully you should find a questionnaire. Please、um, complete the questionnaire after the lecture and drop it into the collection box over the reception counter. 讲座马上开始，时间交给讲座主持人，香港中文大学哲学系郑宗义教授，请郑宗教授。So the lecture now begins. Let me pass the time to the moderator, Professor Ah Zhong Yizhong from the Department of Philosophy, CUHK. Okay, thank you. Professor Zhong, please. Thank you. Ah.、Uh, Uh, Professor Chen,、uh, head of New Asia College, Professor Ng, our honourable speaker today, colleagues and students, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Welcome to the first lecture of the seven New Asia lectures on Confucianism, organised by New Asia College of the Chinese University of Hong Kong. And I'm Zhong Yi Chen, the moderator today from the Philosophy Department of CUHK. Today we are delighted to have Professor Ong Zhou Ng. Wang Zhu, Jiao Zhou, speak for the new Asia lectures on Confucianism. Professor Yi is an internationally renowned scholar working on Chinese intellectual history, philosophy, and religions. He is professor of history, Asian studies, and philosophy, and the founding head of the Asian Studies Department at the Pennsylvania State University. His research specialties have started in. Late Imperial China, Chinese intellectual history, and extended to various topics, including Confucian hermeneutics, religiosity, ethics, and historiography. Professor Yi has published quite a few books, including Qing to Confucianism in the Earlier Qing, Mirroring the Past, and the Imperative of Understandings. His many articles have appeared in. A top and reputable journals such as Tao Philosophy East and West, Journal of Chinese Philosophy, Journal of World History, and the Journal of History of Ideas.、Uh, Professor Yi is also the co-editor of the book series on Chinese intellectual history, published by National Taiwan University's、uh, associate editor of the Journal of Chinese Philosophy, and also the vice president of the International Association for Yijing Studies. Today he will speak on the topic: a synthetic representation of Confucian thought, existential concerns, and conceptual vocabularies. May I invite all of you to join me to welcome Professor On Zhong. Thank you very much.、Um, I suppose you hear me loud and clear. In fact, I'm not even sure if I need the mic because、um, I'm I'm just loud. I, <laughs> I'm a loud guy. Let's put it this way.、Um, well, thank you so very much for inviting me. This is、um, surely an honor, a pleasure, and I'm invited actually by New Asia College. When you think about New Asia College, you think about this august institution. August in what sense? Because it is known as the bastion of Chinese learning. 
So essentially, it's a stronghold of Chinese culture. And in fact, uh, it was founded for this very purpose of preserve, preserving and promoting and propagating Chinese culture. So um, there are many, of course, scholars affiliated um, with Eurasia College. And in one way or another, I'm indebted to their scholarship, even though um, I didn't really study with them as such, um, but their scholarship, the learning certainly furnished a foundation on which major scholars could build on. So I acknowledge my immense debt to scholars such as Chen Wu, um, Mao Zemzan, Tang Junyi, uh, well, not to mention one of the first graduates of New Asia College, uh, Professor Yu Ying Shi, um, whom I actually knew quite well because one of my books, uh, Mirroring the Past, uh, uh, gratefully received his calligraphy. It's actually it's on the cover of the book. So I visited uh, him several times in Princeton because I'm, I'm pretty close to uh, Princeton University. But anyway, um, thank you, uh, Professor Chen. Thank you, Professor Zhang. And thank you all for participating, for attending. Um, I know things are opening up, but still, you know, when you're outside, you have to wear the mask and it's not exactly convenient. Uh, I was just told that I cannot take this off, so I will have to be masked. A masked speaker. You know this television show called Mask Singer, right? You know, is it here in Hong Kong? Well, suddenly mask lecturer. Um, all right. So I was asked to uh, talk about Confucianism. Confucianism, huge, big topic. Um, so what should I talk about? Now, I want to talk about Confucianism first in English. It's almost a deliberate, a purposeful move on my part. Now, not to mention that my Mandarin is rather poor. My Cantonese is my native tongue. However, I certainly haven't used it for academic purposes for 50 years, maybe. So, um, but anyway, I think it makes perfect sense every now and again to talk about Chinese culture, Chinese philosophy, and Confucianism in English, largely because it would be a shame that the world does not know that Confucianism is a synthetic, integrated, holistic, comprehensive philosophy that offers a good deal, not only as an academic subject, but as a philosophy of life. You know, so therefore today, I, I want to give you what I call a synthetic representation of Confucian thought. Largely, I feel that there are certain main ideas that are fairly pronounced in the tradition. So, I mean, obviously, we can spend lifetimes studying Confucianism, the very many issues that we can focus on. But there are certain basic paradigms, basic models, basic ideas, basic issues that tend to animate, that tend to enliven this particular tradition. So I hope that today I can highlight these various issues and questions and matters that Confucianism uh, addresses. Now, before I talk about Confucianism, let us think about what philosophy, what thought is all about. Now, philosophy, what is the literal meaning of philosophy is philo, love, to love, sophia, sophie, knowledge, wisdom. So philosophy is the love of wisdom, the love of knowledge. Well, the question then is, what knowledge? Why is about what? You know, if we develop wisdom, wisdom about what? If we develop knowledge, knowledge of what? So let's talk about that first. And then we can talk about the sort of wisdom the sort of knowledge, the sort of principal ideas about living life associated with Confucianism. Now, whenever we think about thought, 
if it is integrated, if it is holistic and comprehensive, almost invariably, thoughts, philosophies, address some fundamental existential questions. Buddhism, Taoism, Christianity, Hinduism, in one way or another, addresses these fundamental basic existential concerns. So just what life is, just what existence is. In other words, what are some of the questions that attend to what we call the human condition? Just what living is all about, living as a human person. First, is the existential concern with the ultimate. So when you go through life, yes, is it all there is? Is this it? I go study, I get a job, I get married, have children, and I die? No. So therefore, from a philosophical point of view, from a religious point of view, no, no, no. There is something greater than our everyday life. From religious terms, of course you say, no, there, there, there is God. There are gods, if it's in a polytheistic tradition. You know, there is the divine, you know, there is the mysterious. So in other words, above and beyond everyday mundane ordinary living there is something greater there is something that is ultimate something that is infinite something that is absolute something that is universal you know now sometimes in philosophical terms we will describe the ultimate, the absolute, the divine, as the site or the source of transcendence. Now, we don't have to go into very heavy-duty um, discussion about what transcendence means. You know, there are a lot of debates, actually, within uh, Confucian studies as to what transcendence is all about. Very simple. Transcendence is the rising above and the going beyond of the mundane the everyday, the ordinary, you know. So the idea is that there is the possibility of the uplift of our soul, the elevation of our being, such that we can achieve some kind of union, communion with the ultimate, with the absolute, with the infinite. In religious terms, God, paradise, heaven, that is the source and site of transcendence, right? Now, in the case of Buddhism, you have the notion of nirvana, the notion of bodhi, the notion of awakening, all those, right? So, of course, in Taoism, you have the notion of the Tao, not to mention that in Confucian and in Confucianism, you also have that. But um, we'll talk about that. Maybe. In every tradition, in other words, you are concerned with the absolute, with the ultimate, with the infinite. You are concerned in one way or another with the question of transcending, that is, rising above and going beyond your ordinary, everyday, mundane life. Right? Now, another question that all traditions address is the question of Humanity, I've included a fancy term here, philosophical anthropology. Ooh, ooh, philosophical anthropology, what is that? Well, anthropology is study of humanity. And philosophical anthropology is from a philosoph philosophical point of view, you determine the nature of being human. So in other words, it's um, human nature. What is human nature? What is being a human person all about? You know? So, um, Confucian, Confucianism, as with other traditions, invariably provides us with a firm, integrated idea as to what human nature is, as to what being human is all about. Now, what is your human beings? you have to organize 
human beings, you know, starting with uh, the nucleus family. From the nucleus family, you have larger families, lineages, lands, and all the way to state and the world as a whole. So in other words, all traditions, all systems of thinking address the question of what is a community? How do we foster a peaceful and orderly, harmonious, happy society? So social organization, communal living, all those things come into question. Now, once you have a sense of community, once you bring people together, like it or not, you would have to have certain ways of achieving order. Now, how do you do that? You do that, of course, through institutions, through laws, through rules and regulations, through government. But more than that, you also need ideologies. You also need um, values. You need norms, right? Uh, so in other words, you need certain ideas that are so powerful, so sensible, that they can serve as a kind of standard of comprehension of how things work. They are so powerful, convincing, that we know that if we abide by them, we will achieve order. So in Western political, social philosophy, the notion of social contract is one of those ideas, for instance. You know, in fact, you, you talk about all those isms, you know, communism, socialism, capitalism, all those isms are essentially ideologies, ideas about how we can foster a dynamic, vibrant society. Yeah, but from, from the subtle point of view, most important, we are dealing with ethics and morality. Now, we use these terms all the time, and I'm sure we have a general understanding. We will simply put, what is the ethical question? What is ethics? Ethics is, what should I do? So that, that's as simple as that. So it's in a communal setting, there's always these questions. What should I do as a member of a society? You know, and what's the moral question, which is the related question. The moral question is, what do I owe others a sense of responsibilities? So they go hand in hand. What should I do? I must do the right thing. That is ethics. Morality is a sense of my relationship with others. What is my obligation to others? So, so this is slightly different, actually. You know, they are intimately related. So once you have decided on what you do, once you know what you should do, there is always this corresponding idea that you are obligated to others, you're related to others, you're indebted to others, okay? Now, once you have a group together, once you have society, once you have a community, things unfold. And in time, there would be the development of a sense of the past, sense of the past of this very community. In other words, history. Historical consciousness comes into being. And in fact, the sustenance, the continuation, and the strengthening and reinforcement of any community relies greatly on this firm and solid, well-defined collective memory, you know. So in other words, the sense of the past, sense of history contributes to the strengthening of a community's identity. We are who we are because of centuries, millennia of growth and development. What we have now is an aggregation of all our past experiences, our past struggles, and that sort of thing, right? So all thoughts, all philosophies address the question of history, sins of the past. And then the last issue, the question of nature, the physical world. So, of course, in philosophical terms, very often this question of nature fundamentally is dealt with by cosmology, the workings of the heavenly bodies, you know, 
just what is the cosmos all about? And moreover, what is our role in this universe, in this material world, in this physical world, right? So I want to actually establish these parameters that suggest that whatever system of thinking that you are dealing with, you have to deal with these fundamental issues that altogether define what we call the human condition, you know? Now, so that is from a very broad point of view that all human beings in one way or another, like it or not, will in some ways, here and there, address certain issues, you know? Now, now we, we can talk about these various essential concerns from a fusion point of view in Confucian terms. So how does Confucianism address, addresses and answers these fundamental, very human uh, questions? So let's first look at the notion of the ultimate, the notion of the infinite, the notion of the absolute. One of those important terms in Confucianism, certainly the term Tian, very unfortunately generally translated as heaven. Obviously, the word heaven is replete with Western religious connotations and notions, most notably is a Christological term, right? Heaven, you know. Now, but then we all know that heaven literally means the sky you know, the sky up above. So, when we look at the Chinese term Tian, we have to look at it as something different from what we understand to be heaven, generally in the uh, Christian sense. You know? So essentially, oh, my glass is fogging up, so I'm going to do without it. I think I can see. <laughs> um, um, right. Now, how, how can we define Tian in the Confucian sense? Well, if you look at it, uh, Tian really is simply what the world is and how it is. It's not a realm or domain that is separate from what, what we regard as the mundane world. It's really the sky. It's really, another way to put it, nature as it is. You know. Now, Tian is both the creator and the field of creatures. <laughs> so in other words, at the same time, we acknowledge that Tian is up there, right? So you have Tian and D, and then you have Ren. You know, this is three-tier cosmological point of view that we all know, right? Tian, D, Ren. But at the same time, despite this acknowledgement, of the elevated nature of heaven, heaven is within us, Tian is within us. At the same time that Tian is the creator, the emanator, or the genetic origin of virtues and ethics, it is in the very midst of us. Now, this is very important. From a confusion point of view, I'll talk more about that. In fact, that represents one of the most important uh, conceptual paradigms in uh, Confucianism, and that is the paradigm of Tian Ren He Yi, the oneness or continuity of heaven and humanity. So, the word Tian conveys elevation, it conveys the sense of ultimate, it conveys a sense of transcendent, but it is also very much a reference to all the creatures, to all the constituents in the world itself. Okay? So, another way to look at uh, Tian actually, it is the self generated, created benign cosmos. There is no creator as such. It's not as though the world, heaven, was created at a certain point, you know, but rather, the world is continually creating. Every moment is a moment of creation. 
you know. And um, the thing to notice is that it is a benign cosmos. It's so generated. It is essentially an organismic, highly organic process of one thing leading to another. It's not as though there is a mandate of cosmic laws. It's not as though cosmic functionings owe themselves to certain uh, creator. No. Things simply happen. Things are self-created, self-generating. Okay? Now, nevertheless, it's very clear. If you look at even the Lunyu, the analects, this sense of awe that Gongzi displayed vis a vis heaven is clear. I think a lot of people, especially in the West, when they look at the analects and look at the Lunyu, look at the teachings of Confucius, eh, you know, it's good, it's good, it's great. But it's really just a set of uh, moral ethical teachings. But what they ignore is that there is a sense of awe, sense of majesty generated by Tian. Now, why is Tian so important? Why does it generate awe for Kung Zi, for Confucius? Well, that is because Tian is ethically, morally prescriptive. That is to say, Tian prescribes the right way of acting. So in that sense, you can say that Tian actually is the genetic origin of what we consider to be efficacious, good ethics and morality. Okay? Now, how does Tian relate to humanity? And that is the notion of Tian Ming. Now, very often when we look at the term Tian Ming, we look at it from the political point of view, right? When every dynasty came into being, when it was established, it's, oh, we've got the Tian Ming, you know, Tian mandates us to become the new ruler. Tian mandates that the existing current rulers being corrupt immoral and ethical must be destroyed, must be eliminated, you know. So dynastic succession, owe much to the transfer of uh, Tianming from one regime uh, to another, from one group to another. But actually, Tianming is more than that. Tianming is something individual. And if you look at the Lun Yu, it's very, very clear that Gongzi, Confucius, considered himself a receiver of the Tianming. So what does this Tianming mean? This Tianming essentially is a sense of mission, a sense to be good, a sense to be moral, a sense to be ethical. Now we talk more about that as to how you should become ethical, moral, that is a lot to do with the actual ethics and morals that uh, Confucianism teaches, right? Now, but at this point, it is important to recognize that one of the most important ideas in Confucianism is that to begin with, there is fundamental continuity, if not oneness, between heaven on the one hand and humanity on the other. What is the mission and goal of all human beings? The mission and goal of all human beings is to live out and realize the goodness represented by heaven. Okay? So, we'll talk more about that. Okay? Now, so on the one hand, in Confucian thinking, you have the notion that we rise above and go beyond everyday mundane living by essentially fulfilling the mandate of heaven. That is to say, by living out the goodness, by realizing the ethical and moral well-being of the cosmos of nature as a whole. Right? But there is a corresponding term, the Tao. 
which also conveys a certain sense of the ultimate. However, that is more sort of conceived of and talked about in human terms. So as human life is guided by the way. So how do you fulfill the mandate of heaven? How do you fulfill this mission of living ethically and morally? You do so by following the way. So if you look at the term, the way, it has two meaning, really. I mean, first, the way is a path, meaning the correct path that you should follow. However, Tao, the way, is also a discourse. Tao, right? You know, Chinese. Tao is a way. But Tao is also to speak of, to talk about. So, in other words, what is Tao? Tao really is a linguistic discourse that encompasses all those good things, all those moral virtues, all those ethical teachings, you know. So in this sense, the notion of way is very, very important because it is a systematic encapsulation, if you like, a systematic encapsulation of the acknowledged ethics and moral norms and values. Not only do we follow them as though we are walking along the right way so that we don't get lost, but we are also constantly talking about it. We are professing it, right? So, so the way has the notion of professing, proclaiming, declaring, the right way, the right way of living. Okay. All right. So very simply, this is a Confucian sense of the ultimate, a Confucian sense of transcendence, of going beyond and rising above. The key to remember is that as you rise above, as you go beyond, you're still very much in the midst of life, because Heaven is simply the world as it is, you know. All the creatures owe their um, allegiance to heaven. But at the same time, heaven is constituted by its very constituents, you know. So, second question, the question of humanity, the question of philosophical anthropology. How does Confucianism define humanity? Let's not be fancy. Philosophical anthropology. Let me actually throw out something very basic that all of us know, which clearly indicates what Confucianism thinks or declares to be the fundamental understanding of humanity. I'm referring to the opening 12 words, characters of the Sam Jing, Sam Jing, the three character classic composed in the uh, 13th century in the Song Dynasty, supposedly by Wang Yinglin, Wang Yinglin. Anyway, you all know the words. Exactly. Yeah, there you go. Carry on. Sing song, Gun. Job song, you. Right? Run the soul. Sing Ben Shan. Right? Sing Ben Shan. Xi Xiang Yuan. This is the Confucian philosophical anthropology. That is that human nature is innately good. Shan. I can talk about these words. I still remember as a primary school kid, you have these calligraphy copy book. And I remember that <laughs> these are the first characters that I try to uh, chase with uh, with the ink brushes, you know, the, the Bobby, uh, but, but you're right. So, um, see, so by the 13th century, the uh, three character classic which is meant to be a uh, popular tool for 
mass education, if there was such a thing. But anyway, to the extent that you gain literacy, the first thing you need to know is that human nature is good. Human nature is shang. Now, of course, then you argue, hey, what about Xin Zi? Xin Zi did talk about the so called uh, of Xing, right? So, so the general uh, 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 translation is uh, evil. Well, it's not a good translation, really. Now, my answer is this Xin Zi, mere confusion, certainly is suspicious of human nature as it is. And in fact, it makes it very clear that in the state of nature, we are by nature actually covetous, we are greedy, uh, we are rebellious, we are prone to chaos and that sort of thing. Now, the one thing we have to remember is that Xin Zi, unlike the legalists, unlike the Fajia people, was actually not contemptuous toward human beings. Human beings have hope. In fact, he places a great deal of emphasis on the importance of our mind heart, our sin. We are blessed with incipient beginning intelligence, our mind heart. If we know what is good, we would want to follow the good, just as a poor person would want to be rich. So in other words, Xin Zi might have said that at the very beginning, we are not good, but we can become good. As I said, he's not contemptuous. So bring brings bring to my other other, other uh, even Western philosopher, uh, philosophers. You know, Thomas Hobbes, for instance. You know, famously declared that life in a state of nature is what solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and short. <laughs> Well, but, there, but he said there is hope. But the hope lies in a creation of a social contract. But even with this social contract, we have to rely on coercion. We have to rely on some kind of sovereign that is going to have the power of superordination. And then we have to subordinate. So superordination, subordination, it's, it's not. Even in Xunzi, even with his emphasis on Li, does not amount to this sort of um, superordination, subordination relationship that let's say Thomas Hobbes talked about. What I'm saying is that the Fajia people, Hobbes, when you talk about human beings, human nature, said, ah, is that, is that. Well, we, 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 uh, of course, there's a the Fajia people, well, no, there isn't, we, we cannot change it. We can only use laws to control it and manipulate it. We do. If we have an orderly society, it's because of laws, right? Clearly enacted, promptly uh, uh, executed, right? But not the confusions, you know? They might have suspicion about the nature of human nature, but they're not contemptuous. Meaning what? Meaning that all the confusions consider human beings, human nature to be malleable. It can be reformed, it can be developed, it can be refined, it can be improved and bettered. The malleability of human nature is an abiding belief in Confucianism, hence the importance of uh, education. You know, because human nature, because humanity is malleable, it can be improved, it can be changed. We can perfect humanity. So the perfectibility of humanity is very much a part of the uh, Confucian philosophical anthropology. Okay, so. What does it mean to perfect humanity? What does it mean to become a perfect human being? Well, essentially, it is the full realization of this cardinal virtue known as Ren Yan. Ren, of course, has been variously translated. In the narrow sense, is translated as benevolence. 
So a sense of compassion, sense of sympathy, the inability to bear the suffering of others. And that's uh, essentially Meng Zi's uh, definition. You know, the inability to bear the suffering of others. You know, sense of benevolence. But Ren really refers to our fundamental humaneness. In fact, Ren represents the full realization of our human heart mind. So human heartedness is a translation of Ren. And in fact, the broadest, probably the most appropriate translation of Ren, Ren is humanity. Because in Meng Zi, once again, he made it very clear. What is, what is Ren? Ren de Ren ye yan jie yan ya. Yeah. The virtue of Ren is the person Ren, right? So in mentions uh, 7B16, you have this very, very famous phrase. What is, what is this full realization of virtue? To fully become human. So, so, so what is Ren? Ren is to possess the quality that makes a person a person. You know, in other words, Ren is the full realization of our human faculties. Ren is the full realization, fruition of our human talents. You know, so therefore, uh, Confucius describes Ren as the Yi Guan, the one thread. So essentially, you're saying that this one thread shoots through all his other ideas okay now if you can develop your human heart if you can develop your humanity to the fullest if you realize the virtue of run then you become this paradigmatic this model person this exemplary exemplary person the jews the jews right now, the Junzi has been variously translated, the early translation, who is the Junzi? Junzi is a gentleman, right? A person with gentle nature, a person with the gentility, with the gentle virtues, you know. But of course, really, Junzi, if you look at uh, the characters, and so Junzi, Junzi literally means the son of a lord, right? And in fact, before the time of Kongzi, when the term Junzi appeared, it referred to essentially people of noble births. So who were the Junzi? Junzi actually were socially the aristocrats. You know, they were the nobility. So what Kongzi did was to, if you like, democratize the term such that when you say you're a Junzi, when you are a Junzi, if you qualify to merit this particular label, you don't need to be of noble aristocratic birth. You only need to be a person of noble character. And Junzi, so a Junzi does no longer refer to one of noble birth, but one of noble character. The foremost of which would be Ren. So Junzi is this person who is fully realizes his or her human potentials and human capabilities and, and faculties. All right. Now, the, the emergence of this particular term to me is tremendously important. That when um, Junzi redefine what a, who a Junzi actually is, to me, it represents a kind of very critical awareness of the gap between what ought to be and what is. Now, if you look at the development of ethics and morality in all sorts of philosophical traditions, this critical sense of what ought to be the ideal and what actually is the reality drives the development of ethics. When I say, well, I've got to be ethical, I've got to do the right thing. Well, why? Well, because there are all sorts of wrong things happening. You know, there are all sorts of immoral things happen, so there were, I got the right wrong. So that's why it's always important to talk about ethics. Why? Because we 
surrounded by unethical and immoral things and conditions, right? So if the conditions is not like that, then what's the point in constantly talking about ethics and morality, right? So that's one thing we have to remember, and that is that um, the notion of Junzi to me is actually fairly revolutionary. To ascribe nobility to one on account of virtue, the foremost of which would be Ren. Then your, your questions should be okay, okay. Ren is kind of abstract to be human, to have the quality that makes a person a person. What is that? Well, concretely then. <laughs> Ren is expressed and manifested through li or rituals. So that brings us to yet another existential concern of Confucianism. And that is that virtues, when they're manifested, could be conceived as what we generally call Li. Li is a sense of propriety, a sense of decorum, courtesy, politeness, right? It's a narrow meaning. So when we say that there are rituals, that when there are Li that we perform, Li that we abide by, essentially we're talking about the niceties, the pleasantries to begin with. Say good morning, shake hands, bow, whatever the case may be, you know served food to friends and what have you. That is the basic form of expression of the sense of propriety, right? But Li, of course, broadly construed, represents the ethical, moral, normative order. And that is to say, Li as a whole provides the sense of that which we should value. That's the meaning of values, right? something we value. Li is norm, that which is normal. You know, so it's the meaning of a norm. <laughs> norm is that which is normal, right? No, but more broadly construed, why did Confucius, or many Confucius, keep talking about Li, Li Jiao, teachings of Li? Well, that is because Li, Broadly understood, broadly construed, really refers to this cultural chain of memory of any community. Li actually conveys a collective memory. Li actually reinforces our own sense of self. It establishes a sense of identity. You know, can you just talk about, you know, badly, degenerately, you know, so in other words, you know, if you don't perform the Li, you are actually degrading yourself. You are actually watering down your identity as a member of a community, you know? So through Li, you can discriminate one community from another, you know? Through Li, you establish a certain identity. Your are tremendously important, right? So this is what Li is all about. Now, one thing we have to remember is that Li, in the Confucian sense, is very much underpinned, is very much uh, underlined by two major notions or principles, if you like. And that is to say, what are the good Li? What are the good rituals? What is a good ritual order? Well, a good one is based on Shu. So in other words, Li is not coercive. Li actually represents reciprocal concern. It represents tolerance. It is a sympathetic concern with others. You know, and that is to say, Li establishes the way of correct behavior. And this correct behavior is never one-sided. This correct behavior is always reciprocal, at least a two-way traffic. 
you know, there's no one sided Li. Another way to put it is Li never presumes that one party is always the beneficiary and then another party is the benefactor. I give you stuff, but I don't get anything in return. No. The Confucian notion of Li is based on the notion that there is reciprocity, there is sympathetic concern, you know. And in fact, Shu is the principle of analogy, you know. That is to say, we have to analogize what we do with others. Well, to put it very simply, we have to put ourselves in others' shoes. And of course, I didn't put it down, and that would be the Confucian golden rule. Do not do to others what you do not want others do to you. That is actually the underlying spirit of the ritual order. All the li is meant to be at least two-way traffic. There is interaction. There is the benefactor. There is the beneficiary. And in different contexts, in different circumstances, in conditions, uh, they express themselves differently. Sometimes you are the benefactor, sometimes you are the beneficiary. There's never an occasion when you only play one role or the other. So this is, so, so the, the maintenance, the operation of Li and the ritual order was very much driven by this underlying principle of reciprocity, reciprocal concern. All right. Now, another related notion is the notion of Zhengming, Zhengming, rectification of names. So that's what Li does. Every ritual, every ceremony, every act of propriety essentially carries a sense of correctness, that which is right, that which is rectified. You know, if we perform this, we are rectifying certain human relations, you know. Now, but then this process of rect rectification is very much related to means, you know, Ming. Now, Ming, Ming here actually refers to social roles. And of course, Zhang Ming, this particular notion, is really related to the notion of Wu Lun, right? Ruler officials, father and son, husband, wife, friends, and then brothers. And then when we talk about Wu Lun, San Gang, San Gang is the first she, right? <laughs> Ruler and officials, and uh, uh, father, son, and then husband, wife. And then, Ooh, San Gang, Wu Lun, wow, coercive. Back to the two terms I use, superordination and subordination, right? <laughs> but if you think about it, this is not so. When Confucianism talks about Ren Lun, which reads this notion of Zheng Ming, because, you know, whatever Lun you're talking about, you got to rectify it, right? Because every Lun has a certain social niche. You say, Mah. This is coercive, this is repressive. It could be. And in fact, in history, on many occasions, in many contexts, that was the case. But if you first look at the notion of Zhongming, it is the most natural expression of what natural life is all about. Most fundamentally, when one is born, like it or not, there is a son. There might be a daughter, and there will be parents, there will be cousins, there will be uncles, nephews, you name it. So what is the notion of rectification of names? The idea is that, look, we have no choice in life but play a particular role which is not up to us. The moment you're born, you're born as a child. The more you're born, <laughs> parents will have to become parents, whether they like it or not. So, the so-called 
，君孙臣臣，父父子子。What are they? Essentially, they're saying that if you are a ruler, act like a ruler. If you are a father, act like a father. If you are a friend, act like a friend. Be a real friend. So on and so forth. If you're a professor, act like a professor. If you're a student, act like a prof、uh, student. If you are a bus driver, act like a bus driver. If you're a soldier, act like a soldier. If you're the duck so, act like the duck so. <laughs> Whatever the case may be, I'm simply saying that all roles, starting with familiar roles, carries responsibilities. And in carrying out responsibilities, you are rectifying your social label. In familial terms, could be father, could be son, could be nephew, could be a shoo shoo, could be a poor poor, whatever the case may be, right? And this is the workings of the right. Now, once you have a what time is it now? And keep talking. Oh my my goodness! All right. Very soon we we have to stop here. I'm, I'm running out of breath anyway. I'm, I'm running out of steam. But then there is coffee. No, no worries. You know we can stay here as long as you want. Ah, another existential. So once you have the community, once you have the society, a sense of history is born. A sense of past is born. We all celebrate our past. First, you celebrate your own individual history, of course. But as a community, there is history. But in fact, history in the Confucian context is normative. That is to say, in Confucian terms, history is understood to be that which conveys the most normal, because it happened once upon a time. It is our precedent. It is the normal example. It is what we should follow. Now, why is that? It doesn't matter. It doesn't make sense. Why? Why should? Anything that happened should be something that we follow. Well, that is because, in Confucian terms, history is fundamentally understood as the past deeds and actions of the cultural heroes, the sage kings, the Wang Di's, the Yao's, the Shun's, the Yu's, the Duke of Zhou's, the Zhou Gongs. You know, so in Confucian terms, actually, history is understood as the glorious, as the virtuous deeds and actions of all these rulers, sage rulers. They're not only rulers, but they are sagely rulers, right? So, therefore, history is normative in this sense. I mean, really, if you look at,、um, let's say, Confucius, Xunzi, Mengzi. As philosophers, let's say they're philosophers, which they were actually. They were not appealing some abstract examples in the formulation of what is right and wrong, what we should do, what we should not do. What they appeal to first and foremost is historical reasonableness, that which is reasonable. So, what is the foundation of ethics? What is the foundations of morality? Things that have occurred in the past. As done and performed by the sage kings, which demonstrates their reasonableness, it makes sense for things to be done that way. Look at the results. We are inheritors of this great culture, of this great society, thanks to these guys' actions, right? So, therefore, this. Sense of history is very closely related to a major paradigm in Confucian teachings, and that is the paradigm of the sage king. Whether you're talking about Kongzi, whether you're talking about Xunzi,、uh, uh, uh, you know, the, all, all the later thinkers within Confucian tradition, they always talk about Xian Wang, the former kings. You know, they always talk about the Xian Sheng. The former sages, the sages. Who are these? These were the cultural heroes of ancient China, of Sun Dai. You know the Shang Zhou, right? Now, look at the Yao Dian. The very beginning of the Shang Shu, 
the book of documents. You have the Yao Dian. What is Yao Dian all about? What is the Shang, Shang Shu all about? The so called classic of documents or the classic of history? Well, first and foremost, the glorification, commemoration of the great deeds of this ruler. Yeah. All right, I think it's worth looking at this whole passage. Examining into antiquity, we find that Yao was styled Fang Shun. He was, now look at this, he was reverential, intelligent, accomplished, and thoughtful, naturally and without effort. He was sincerely courteous and capable of all kindness. The bright influence of these qualities was felt through the four quarters of the land and reached to heaven above and earth beneath. He made the able and virtuous distinguished and then proceeded to the love of all in the nine classes of his clan who thus became harmonious. He also regulated and polished the people of his domain who all became brightly intelligent. Finally, he united and harmonized the myriad states and so the black haired people were transformed. The result was universal peace. This is what a ruler is all about. This is what history is all about. History is all about these characters who are like that. Now, if you look, if you look, if you look at this passage, it should remind you of the sequence of progression of ideal actions. The first step is Shushan, Sausan, cultivate the self. Cultivate the self for what purpose? So that you can acquire all these qualities. You you become uh, referential, intelligence, accomplished, thought, thought da, 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 whatever, you know. Shushan. What is the next step of the Shushan? Shushan, Sausan, Jijian, I Well, look, look at this, look at this. He made the able and virtuous distinguish and then proceeded to the love of all in the nine classes of his clan. He regulated his family. He, she is Jia. What's the next one? Chai Ga and then Chi Jia and then what? He regulated and polished the people of his domain. <laughs> That's Chi Guo. Uh, what is the last one? Yeah. Now you know. The result was universal peace. Dasha, great learning, became an ideal, and du during ideal, this natural sequence of ideal actions, beginning with the forging of our individual character, ending in bringing peace to the world. Oh, yes. All right, um, history, all right, next one. So, so far we've been talking about the domain of um, human beings. So very briefly, of course, in Confucian terms, nature is very important. The physical world, the material world, the cosmos, the world as it is. And of course, the most important text here is our famous Yi Jing. The Yi Jing fundamentally is a graphic representation, a symbological representation of the vibrancy, the aliveness, the animation of the natural world. The natural world is not conceived as something inert. The natural world is something that is, as I said, vibrant vital, alive, animated, because it is so. Human beings must be in tune with and attuned to the rhythms of nature. So every time I look at even the, the, um, the trigrams, uh, the eight trigrams, the, the bakwa, right? It brings to mind, you know, this, this, this song and this famous uh, movie and musical that you know, Sound of Music. The hills are alive with the sound of music, with songs they have sung for a thousand years. You're in the middle of a mountain, surrounded by trees, airs, 
What do you sense? The songs they have sung in a thousand years. Well, because nature is alive. So when you look at the Bagua, first and foremost, what does the Yijin tell us? It tells us that we are in the midst of a vital, vibrant, animated nature. And because of that, we are like the psychic tuning fork. A tuning fork, even if you touch it slightly, there is tremor, there is vibration. And you sense the resonance, you know. So essentially, the Yi Jing asks us to be that sensitive, that we are not individual beings, but rather we are beings who share this mutuality. Nature and humanity are ultimately one, and I particularly appreciate this notion of Guan. Now, Guan is not passive viewing. Guan is comprehensive observance. Guan is actually being attuned to the aliveness of nature. And if you go on that way, inevitably, you have gone. You have this reflection. You have this feeling. And this reflection, this feeling, will generate response. I mean, it's fundamentally, this is, this is what divination is all about. Divination is not going to wherever they divine and say, hey, look, tomorrow am I winning the lottery? Or something like that. No. The idea is that to a general understanding of the 64 hexagrams, you come to know the germinal, fundamental, basic circumstances and conditions of human living in the midst of nature. You know, so in other words, it, it, it's essentially a realm of possibilities. Go, go back to our understanding of uh, Chen. Chen is not some god of pure possibilities. No. Heaven is in the midst of us, so therefore, there are certain possibilities that are actually, I wouldn't say confined, but defined. So the 64 hexagrams essentially provide us with a general integrated, comprehensive understanding of some of the basic fundamental circumstances and situations where we encounter. And if we are sensitively attuned to them, if we understand them, what we can do is to generate Gan and Yin. And in the process, we arrive at solution. So that brings us back, the Yi Jing brings us back to this notion of Tianren He Yi, which to me, together with the Sage King paradigms, constituted two major pillars of Confucian thinkings. One pertains more to the social political domain, the other pertains more to uh, the domain of individual uh, self cultivation. And the um, achievement, attainment of moral and ethical excellence. In other words, to become a Junzi. Well, I think uh, we, we should stop here. I mean, I, I've been talking not nonstop. Yeah, I mean, more, more than an hour. I thank you very much for your attention. And I thank you for bearing with my uh, silly singing a little bit anyway. <laughs> All right, so Q&A time. Thank you again very much. Thank谢我教授精彩演讲。接下来是问答环节，欢迎在场人士踊跃发问，请大家举手示意。工作人员会把麦克递送过来，呃，线上的朋友们可以文字提问，主持人会把你的提问读出来。The uh, following time, following time would, be the Q &A would be the Q and A session. All of you are welcome to raise your hand, and I'll pass the microphone to you before asking your question. For those online online audiences, please feel free to text your questions. Professor Zhang will then read out your questions. Okay, thank you. So now we move on to the uh, Q&A sections. And first of all, I would like to thank Professor Ng's very rich 
clear and, and inspirational talk uh, to introduce the essentials uh, features of what Confucianism really uh, the, about. So uh, now we have some, uh, we have audience here and also we have some audience online. So uh, as just mentioned that you can raise your hands and ask your questions before the talk, I just uh, ask uh, Professor Ng whether he is fine to receive questions asked in Cantonese and Mandarin. Uh, Cantonese his mother tongue indeed, and Mandarin and he generously say yes. So. Uh, please feel free to ask your questions in in neither uh, uh, Chinese, I mean, Cantonese, Mandarin, or English. You want uh, three languages? Yeah, 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 three languages. Chinese university is supposed to be trilingual. <laughs> <laughs> I was just told that's the only university that is trilingual. Yeah, yeah, okay. So please feel free to ask your questions, yeah. And raise your hands and uh, you can speak loudly or we have some workers to give you the, the, the microphone. And for online audience, you can just type your questions and I and I can ask the question for you. So please feel free. We still have about uh, half an hour. Okay, yeah, I'm going to continue to talk. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yes, please. Uh, thank you so much for your for your presentation. And um, yes, Chinese University of Hong Kong is Liang Wen Sang Yu very, very yeah. proudly. And, um, and it's a, a, a pleasure to receive you from afar. And Thank you very much. My, my question, it may be more of a comment, is the concept of Tian and, and how it's held in awe, but as you say, it is essentially something that is in the mists of us. And Konza said at one point in the Analects, which is something that I've always held um, really, really interesting, is to so I do not talk of strange cosmic forces or gods is kind of my off the cuff translation of it. What do you think Kongzu was saying when he was making that comment? Well, actually that by no means contradicts with our understanding of his understanding of Tian. Essentially, he was simply referring to certain religious rites and rituals which are not necessarily always related to his understanding of, of heaven. So therefore, in fact, a lot of commentators say, look, 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 Confucius really did not have a religious sense. That's wrong. He, he was imbued with a very strong sense of religiosity. It's just that it's not the Christian one. And that is to say, he cares about transcendence. If we define religiosity or religiousness simply as this constant urge to go beyond and rise above the mundane and the ordinary. You know. So he was simply, essentially, I believe, referring to certain base rites, which are so obsessed with spirit, you know. Um, of course, it was, oh, we don't know enough about um, the human world, so we just bother about, you know, the Guayan Shen and Guayan Shen and all that stuff, you know. So, so then we'll be taking examples that, uh, oh, you know, Confucianism, Confucius was simply a moralist, he was simply interested in, in teachings of ethics and, and, and morality. No, no, no. And, and in fact, um, if you remember, it was oh, so long ago, this shows you how. how old I am. Do you still remember Yu Dan, which became actually quite, quite famous in, uh, in the early alts, right? I, I think he publishes uh, Lun Yu Xin De, right? His, uh, in, uh, I, I think, uh, 2006 or something like that. Yeah, it's okay. already quite, quite a while ago. Now, there's something wrong with that text. I don't take great issue with it. However, if you simply look at her interpretation, or is it Luntan, you know, she has a series of, <laughs> of seven talks or something yeah, like that, yeah, right, yeah. in the Luntan. Her interpretations are okay. However, she only focused on those things that simply so, oh, be content, you know, uh, you know, like, uh, uh, take life as it, as it comes. And there's no mention exactly of this sense of awe, the sense of moral obligations, the sense that the world is sadly out of joint and we have to receive this Tian Ming. We have to realize this Tian Ming in order not only to better ourselves, myself, but also the world. 
You see, so 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 uh, I think when we approach, um, that's how I do it anyway. I do view it as a kind of quote unquote religious tradition. I do view it as something that very much cares about the universal, the absolute. But it's just that those things must be found within ourselves. So therefore, the major philosophical debate is what kind of transcendence do we get in Confucianism? <laughs> that we can, you know, talk forever about that, right? Is it uh, transcendence within immanence? Um, or is it or no transcendence at all, you know? Um, should we talk about transcendence only in the uh, uh, Christological sense, you know, that sort of thing? So, no, a great question. I'm glad you actually raised that because then I can, you know, once and for all debunk the myth that confusion did not care about some form of religious ultimate. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Any questions? Uh, hello, uh, I'm a student come, comes from CUHK, uh, and I will ask a question in Cantonese. Uh, sure. So, uh, I uh, 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 價值會出現一個矛盾,因為如果是要行天道才是有價值的話,那個時候行天道都跟不上。Well, first, I'm not so sure that is the right view of uh, Song Liu Confucian thinking. Are you sure that's what Lao Tzu Wong said? That the, 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 the Song understanding of heaven is contingent on this notion of repudiation of others. Where, where's the textual evidence? I've never read that before. Um, for example, uh, may I use? Yes, of course, of course. <laughs> It'd be great if I can learn something new, which I'm learning all the time anyway, since I know very little. And uh, for example, uh, what should I say? Uh, the Tongshu. So, yeah. Uh, and, uh, no, no, no. Is the way you put it is a misunderstanding of the principle here. Of course, when you're talking about alternation of yin and yang, it, involve some kind of destruction. Yeah. So if you look look at the Wu Xing, you talk about destruction, but, but don't ever forget the rebirth part, the resurrection part. The idea is that is not that we seek to destroy, is that what we generally perceive as destruction is merely the beginning of a different life. So in other words, I said that very early on in my talk. Every moment is a moment of creation. And this creation actually requires the diminishing and ultimately the elimination of a certain thing. But this process of destruction and elimination does not refer to what we generally regarded as death as such. Rather that this occasion of something disappearing is exactly the occasion on which something else is being born, something else is being created. So if you think about it, the Chinese cosmological view is very much um, conditioned and influenced by the notion, the metaphor of 
sheng. Now, without si, there is no sheng. Is that kind of um, notion of creation? Now, whereas if you look at the, the Christian notion, the Western notion is the notion is to manufacture, to make. Whereas in the Chinese sense is something being born, to give birth to something, to sheng 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 sheng. You know. So uh, there, there's no inherent co contradiction between your understanding of, of what, what, you, what you read there. But essentially, the kind of death and destruction that you see there really are occasions of creation. That is really the giving of life. So you see, Sapan, I don't think Lao Tzu would say, well, with that being the case, it's very negative. He will what life is all about. No, he's simply saying that without death, there is no, no birth. I believe now, of course, I have to read your text. I, I don't know whether I've been misunderstood you, but anyway. Okay, any questions? Please. Okay. Very good. Well, in other words, you're very smart because you're in CUHK. You're in CUHK. <laughs> Cheers for that. Um, well, uh, my questions will be, do you think there are even just a tiny bit of contradiction between um, his suggestions on um, giving the correct names, giving the social norms and the transcendence within each and every one? I'm, I'm not talking it about in a, in, a, in, a, in a personal sense, the transcendence, as in um, the social sense of transcendence, so the society can move forward. Uh, do you think there is a, just a little bit of a contradiction between these two thoughts? Now, from a purely ideational or philosophical point of view, there need not be any contradiction. I think our general discomfort with these types of thinking is that these types of thinking have unfolded in actual history with a rather questionable past, you might say. Yeah. So in other words, a lot of the ideas were appropriated, were used and manipulated in a particular way that they become, became tools and instruments of superordination and subordination. So my point is that these ideas, if they are properly understood, but that's why we study Confucian thought. If history already is the judge, there's no discussion. We need, we need not argue the fact that many of the regimes that we, we, we see in the past were despotic, arbitrary, you know. But, but on the other hand, what we are trying to do is that, look, you have this holistic philosophical system that presumes certain viewpoints that address the human condition and to the extent that they actually do, but in different ways, what can we learn from them? We have to free ourselves from history. History is averted, but it's not everlasting. And essentially, there, there would be the teachings of people like uh, Tang Junyi or Mao Zongshan. They're very aware of Chinese history. What explained their faith in Confucianism? Why do they think that actually Confucianism is the key to the regeneration of Chinese culture or the birth of a new China? Well, that is because if we have a renewed, brand new understanding of Confucianism, we do it. We, we need certain ideological foundation. And unfortunately, yes, 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 in the past, supposedly all the regimes, all the dynasties, you know, embraced Confucianism as a state philosophy. But they did not necessarily actually uh, uh, realize the actual goals, the actual goodness of these ideas. Now, they might sound very idealistic, but on the other hand, not really. If you think about it, all social, political, economic policies must have their ideological underpinning. If you have a certain view, let's say of the individual, not just now actually I pointed to two different 
already. I, I, I pointed to one and implied the other, and that is the Confucian view of the individual is that we are born into a network of obligations from which we have no escape. I mean, you think that you can escape from being a son the moment you're born, there's something wrong. If your parents think that they can escape that role, the moment that happens, there is something wrong. Now, but if you look at the uh, Western, modern Western notion of the individuals, what is an individual? The individual is a completely free entity. The Voltaire said famously, man is born free, but he's everywhere in chains. <laughs> now, of course, you can understand Zhang Ming and all the, the Wu Lun and relationships as chains, you know. But I think I've already, you know, provided a certain alternative explanation as to what the Wu Lun is all about. It's the most natural of all social relations. So I think your question pertains to your sense of history as a burden, which is, which it is. But the, the whole point here is to free ourselves from that. In order to do that is to have what, what the you know, new Asian forebears did and have been doing, really. Their, their descendants, including you, actually. Here's the Dasha here. Uh, okay. so maybe, maybe allow me to add just a, a, a bit uh, uh, to Professor Ng's uh, uh, answers. I think uh, to to play a social role, or for example, to be a son, doesn't imply that you only conform to the given reality. But you have to ask how to be a good son, how to be a truly son, how to be a perfect son. And then that means you still have to, have to get a sense of transcending your mundane. Yes. That doesn't yeah, like yeah, any yeah, contradictory exactly. between the sense of transcending and also the sense of uh, following the ritual propriety, the way it's in a, in a communal life. Okay, any questions? Yeah, please. Hi, Professor. Uh, I'm an alumnus of the Hong uh, ZUHK. Um, I just want to ask you, um, to what extent the Chinese are yeah, adopting the Confucianism in uh, ruling the country. Do you see any sign that they are actually actively applying the Confucianism to rule the country in China? <laughs> okay. Well, I'm not so sure if I'm the expert in this area because you're really talking about uh, very contemporary political science and uh, I, I don't particularly observe um, what actually is going on. I mean, it's all, almost not the point. Now, to begin with, let, let me, it may sound as though I'm trying to evade the question. Now, you tell me, which government on earth has been able to fully realize the proclaimed political ideology or philosophy in such a way that problems are not created? Look at the states vastly touted as the most mature democracy, what do we see? Tremendous paralysis in government. What do we see? Huge gap between the rich and the poor. So we see all sorts of problems in a system which is widely touted as the true form of uh, democracy. Now, case of China, certainly no question in the last, you know, at least 30 years or so, there has been a certain move to integrate Confucian ideas into governance and rulership. And I think it's a good thing. Now, as to whether it's actually uh, fully realized that, I mean, of course not. But on the other hand, which country, which regime has successfully realize the proclaim political philosophy. Not really, no one has done it. There are always problems. You always make compromises, you know. So I don't know whether I've answered your question because I, I think first, I, I don't know enough. And second, it seems to me that even from a general point of view, there is no such thing as a full realization. Well, so 
So that's why a lot of people say that uh, Confucius is an idealist. Essentially, what he wants to do is look. We are going to have a great, happy, harmonious society, community, regime if everyone becomes a Junzi. So, what is the idea? The ideal is that everyone must be a Junzi. You know, but of course, it's not possible. I mean, you, you talk about any religious tradition. The idea is that you know everyone should be sin free. Has that ever happened? No. <laughs> In the Buddhist context, everyone should be able to have detachment. Everyone should be able to achieve nirvana. No. And in fact, the idea is that there will be. People who who will be、uh, entrapped in the process of birth and re re rebirth, samsara, transmigration of the soul, the turning of the wheel goes on. Otherwise, there is no life as, as such. If everyone achieves、um, bodhi, you know,、uh, uh, nirvana, there's no ordinary life. You know. Now, so in some ways, Confucianism is only one example. To the extent that we talk about moral philosophy. To the extent that we worry about different religious traditions making contributions in this way or that, essentially we are saying that we realize that the world is always out of joint. The world always has problems. There are always better men that we must strive toward and forward than for. That being the case, where are the resources? And I do believe that Confucianism is one of the rich resources that the world, not just China, can use in order to, you know, address all these universal human condition questions. So that's my quote unquote answer to you. Not not quite satisfactory, but that's the best I can do. Okay. Any questions? Yes, please. Who's the students? Um, hello, Professor. I'm also a student from CHK. Um, I would like to uh, uh, ask a question uh, with Cantonese. Uh, then, if I'm, 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 佢哋要點樣接受去話自己嗰啲天命係即係有有一個叫所謂天命嘢喺度咧？即係佢哋可以介到，即係要去做嘅天命。即係如果對嗰啲唔信儒家嘅人嚟講 ，Well，no first you have to persuade them. <laughs> so in other words, everyone should be a Confucian in some ways. You just be better. You become a better person if you take on some Confucian ideas. Let's put it this way. Now, but on the other hand. Who is to say that if you abide by Christian beliefs, if you follow Buddhist ideas, if you are a faithful Hindu, you are not going to be someone who is going to be like a Junzi? In other words, every tradition has a certain definition of this paradigmatic person. This Junzi variously translated as the superior person, the profound person. The moral sovereign. I mean, all these various translations refer to the fact that we acknowledge that if you try hard enough, if you learn the right way, if you pursue the right values, follow the right norms, you become someone who can transcend the mundane, you can transcend the ordinary, and in the process become an elevated, profound person. Call it Junzi. Call it anything at all. You know. Okay. Okay.、Um, I've got one further question on my previous one. So obviously, um, uh, uh, the, the 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 Confucianism uh, actually um, displays、uh, a very strong sense of obeyance, or, or even um.、Uh, Going back to the history to to find, because、uh, we talk about sage kings and all sort of stuff. But compared to the Western philosophy, we don't actually have that. Probably they are not lucky enough 
to have Sage Kings in some ways, but we are so lucky that we got so many Sage Kings. But this sense of going back to history, will you think that, because you obviously study Asian studies and, 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 and this um, Confucianism affects uh, not only China, but also the whole Asia in, in the school of thoughts. Uh, would you think that um, this is going back to history, finding the, uh, our basic notions from history um, affects um, the whole Asia in, in terms of uh, philosophy? Finding enough sage kings, you mean? Uh, yeah. Before you go back to history. Because um, cause I, I, cause, you know, uh, I literally just studied uh, uh, Western philosophy and they did not have such things as, as I should go back uh, and find um, uh, points to make um, further on or, or, or more uh, or even heroes to, 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 to follow on. But, but in, in, in Confucianism, there is a strong sense of, oh, we should obey um, what they have done and, and do as such as such. Uh, first, when you're talking about Western philosophy in your context, you're talking about modern Western philosophy. You're talking about philosophy from the Enlightenment onward. In other words, before the Enlightenment in Western history, there is a very strong sense of the Golden Age. In other words, until you, you get to the uh, 17th, 18th century, the Enlightenment period, the ancients were regarded as exemplary figures. So in other words, history is degenerative. We had a great past, but then we are unable to emulate and follow what those great leaders did in the golden age. Now, but, but by the time of the Enlightenment, what happens, as, as you probably know, is this huge debate about ancients versus the moderns. So, so by the Enlightenment, you have the rejection, essentially, of the ancients as adequate or good examples. You know, now, whereas in the case of China, this rejection of the past really did not happen until the May 4th movement. Truly. Now, before that, you have so many isolated examples. But you remember, you know, Lin um, Yusheng, uh, you know, wrote, as you say, hey, hey, ho. A uh, whole book on anti-traditionalism, iconoclasm, Sorry. Sorry. in the May 4th. So, now in the case of China, this kind of iconoclasm, the striking down of the old icons or models, occurred in the early 14th century, whereas in Europe, it occurred in the 17th, 18th century, during the Age of Enlightenment. So it's not quite true that um, in the case of Western philosophy, there was no huge emulation of the ancients. Now, on this point, let, let me talk about back, back to this Wulun, his family thing. Now, of course, if you study uh, 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 Western philosophy, especially in terms of uh, political philosophy, you talk about Athenian democracy, the polis, Athens. What is Athens known for? The creation of the polis, the state. And what is so important about that? because you establish the ideal of the citizen. The citizen as the most important element in this setup, not the family, but the polis. Now, the problem is that we tend to forget that Aristotle very much talked about the household and the family. What is the complement to polis? Oikos, O-I-K-O-S. So in Aristotle, Greek philosophy, there is a lot of reference to the household, to the family, as the most basic unit of the polis. It's just that very often we look back, who? Polis, citizenship, not familial role, not uh, uh, fam family members in a household setting. But actually, until again, really, in, in the, um, until the Enlightenment, it was a very healthy regard. For the ancients, healthy regard for the oikos, not simply just the polis, you know. So, uh, I, 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 sorry, I didn't put myself clear enough. Because um, Confucian himself yeah. is in the similar age of Socrates, yes. as far as I know. So, I, I, I was trying to ask a question. That because Socrates. 
who has his own thoughts on uh, further on philosophy or philosophy. To such, but Confucian himself found that um, probably at the time he, he he regards himself as a as a as a summarizer or, 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 a, or a pioneer in thinking that um, finding truths or history, uh, successful history, uh, as such, will be a good thing to add on the time uh, he was in. So so I was t uh, I, I, my question was about why did. Uh, Socrates thinks so much onwards, but Confucius thinks so much backwards. Well, in the, these are unanswerable questions because essentially, what, what you know, why, why did a certain culture develop in a particular way? Because, you know, for, for instance, you know, if you study Chinese history, hey, why, why is there no science in China? The counter question is, why should there be science in China? Now, first, actually, there was plenty of science in China. Let's put it this way. Let, let's get that straight first. But when you say that there is no science in, in traditional China, it's because you have this no veneration of the scientific culture as such. You know, one perplexing thing, you know, uh, Professor Zhang is you know, Tai Zhen. Tai Zhen's mathematics is really quite, quite good. Now, I mean, I'm not a math guy, but when I look at his math stuff, no one looks at that, except this French scholar. No, my, my point is, um, Every culture is, for whatever reason, developed in a particular way. Therefore, you're quite right. Western philosoph philosophical tradition is quite different from uh, the, the Chinese philosophical tradition. But at the same time, we shouldn't simply exaggerate or focus on the differences without thinking about the possible similarities. For instance, when I'm saying that, hey, don't just think that Aristotle only talks about the polis. He talks about the oikos, the, the, the family and the households. Now, for instance, right, in, in comparative philosophy, what's happening is that there is increasingly uh, this, this look at what is called virtue ethics, which is really a product of, of Greek philosophy, in Chinese terms. So it's, can we actually think about um, Confucian philosophy in virtue ethical terms? Mm -hmm. And that is instead of thinking about this Kantian focus on the, uh, the imperative, the laws, you know, uh, you have to look at the action of the agent, which is exactly what, what Chinese philosophy is all about. The focus is not on some abstract prescription as to how you act, like the Kantian notion of the um, categorical, but rather, what do individuals do? That's virtue ethics. So, so my point is that there, there are a good deal of commonalities that we can look at. But, but thank you very much for your questions. But, but, but you know, there's no way we can, we can answer as to why the Greeks develop a particular way of looking at the world, which is more, for instance, epistemologically oriented than is the, no, actually, all those um, existential concerns. One thing that can be added to that, which doesn't quite apply to China is epistemology. How do you know? The theory of knowledge. So part of the human condition is how do we come to know? That's the epistemological question, but it's not a question that uh, that the Chinese were particularly interested in. They talked about true, true knowing knowledge, but every time when true and knowledge is talked about, is talked about in the context of action. So therefore, you have the uh, unity, the oneness of um, action and knowledge. To know is the same thing as to act, right? And that not only applies to Wang Yuming, Wang Yuming was supposedly the one who, who uh, thoroughly developed this particular notion. But look at anyone at all. Look at Zhu Xi, which is supposedly someone, you know, from which uh, Wang Yuming diverged. No, praxis is everything. That is to say, theory is always integrated into action. You know, so. Um, okay. Yeah. Oh, this is oh. Professor Wu. Uh, this is John Lai, a colleague from uh, Chinese University. Um, I'm fascinated, really truly impressed by your fascinating and very vibrant, uh, lively talk. Uh, I'm especially interested in your actually final uh, comment on about the, uh, the Yi Jing, yes. right? Personally, I'm a great fan of Yi Jing. Yes. And uh, you mentioned the uh, very key, uh, key concept of Guan, right? Very comprehensive observant 
observance and reflection about nature in relation to humanity, etc. That reminds me of the hexagram, Guan itself, actually, Guan hexagram, one of the 64 Guan hexagram. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah uh, and that's a very uh, uh, key, a key phrase that is Shen Dao Shi Jiao. Mm -hmm. right? that, that touches upon about the, the issue of uh, the transcendence and religiosity of, of Confucianism in relation to uh, education and also uh, Li, etc. Right? I was wondering, can you elaborate a little bit more on that particular concept, Shen Dao Shi Jiao, in relation to the, uh, the transcendence and uh, religiosity of Confucianism? Well, uh, I, I think you have, you have an expert here, Professor <laughs> Zhang here, I think is in a much better position to answer that. You know, my understanding of these hexagrams essentially is impressionistic, and that's deliberate. Because there are different layers of the aging that enables you to pursue different understanding. I think what you are suggesting is that we should look at the polysemic, the multi-meanings of the certain terms that the Yijing text uses. I have no problem with that. However, I'm not so sure that from a broader philosophical point of view, understanding that phrase needs to be problematic. It's very clear. That's our understanding. In other words, there are always possibilities for transcendence. There is something that is mysterious. There is a mystique. But this mystique is not truly mysterious. This mystique, it really refers to the fact that very often we don't go on hard enough. If you go on hard enough, because maybe every day you listen to a piece of music, you look at a piece of artwork, you look at a verse of poetry, there are different responses to it. Sometimes those things actually hit you hard. Sometimes you, you look at, oh, that's good, that's good, pleasant. In fact, you will say, hey, yeah, 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 what is this, you know, waste of my time. So, you know, that very phrase to me, it sim simply is a reinforcement of the idea that when you go on, it is comprehensive observation. And this comprehensive ob observation is both epistemological and aesthetic. So my understanding of the Yi Jing is essentially aesthetic. You know, the professor asked me to give a lecture. I'm still kind of racking my brain as to what to talk about the Yi Jing, even though I'm supposed to be <laughs> someone who works on it. Um, I want to talk about this. But more from an aesthetic, creative point of view. Now, this creation is, is a mysterious process. So even, but I, the, the Yijing gets that. The Yijing is a creative text. The Yijing asks us to be a psychic tuning fork, as I said. Always resonating with what you see, what you, what, what you discern, what you observe. You know, and there are always mysteries. No, but these mys mys mysteries does not refer to the Gui and Shen. You know? <laughs> the mysteries about very plain facts of life, plain facts of nature that we don't bother to uncover and discover. See? So once again, I deliberately evade your question because frankly, I don't have the uh, philological uh, knowledge to truly plunge into the various... Uh, meanings of those words. I understand them pretty clear to me what it means. Is it okay? Yeah. <laughs> I have to study okay. some more in order to, <laughs> you know. Okay, okay. Yeah, so One more questions. Yes. Thank you, Professor Wu. Yeah. <laughs> I'm also a student from CUHK, right. and my question may be a little bit personal, but I still want to put forward it is uh, how does uh, Confucian philosophy influence you? Uh, as a because uh, we know that you are a researcher or scholar of Confucian philosophy, but you are also a 
an individual in living in the contemporary world. So how does it, uh, uh, sh how does this philosophy shape you as an individual? And uh, mm, are you just uh, uh, doing uh, objective uh, investigation of this uh, philosophical domain, or are you also on the way to become the genes <laughs> to feel, fulfill the character of the uh, yeah. Okay. This is my question. Uh, I think she would like to you uh, to share the ex no, no, the existential embodiment <laughs> of Confucianism. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, there are many Junzi. I'm not one of them. Uh, <laughs> no, Professor no, Zhang no. is one of them. Um, uh, you know, it's not a bad question. Um, it's not too personal, really. Well, my personal background, uh, I actually was baptized as Christian. My family has been a uh, generation, four generation Christian. My great grandparents apparently uh, converted already. I remember my uh, great grandmother, she lived till uh, 96 when I was a kid. We all went to church. Um, but personally, I, ju I just don't find the, the, the Christian teachings persuasive and convincing enough. Of course, if you can talk about moral ethical teachings, of course, there are plenty. It, it's just that in Confucianism, I do find a certain view of transcendence that is more, I think, attuned with my ultimate understanding with life is all about. In other words, what is immortality? What is life hereafter? If you don't, if you even care about these things, to me, is simply do the best that you can so that the day when you leave the earth, you can tell yourself that I have lived a full life to the extent possible while being aware of all those ethical and moral imperatives that Confucianism and also other traditions tell you. Instead of saying that there is this heaven out there, instead of saying that there is a hell out there, they're truly transcendent or to say that there is a God which is the other God. You know, God, you cannot never be God, right? Um, now, to say that, I'm not saying that I'm God myself. I'm simply saying that I could be wrong. I'm just saying it, it's a very personal thing. I, I just find the Confucian cosmological, ontological point of view far more attuned to what being human is all about. This is, of course, not to say that if you abide by other religious beliefs, you're not inhumane or not fully human. I'm just simply saying I don't need the kind of external transcendence to give me a sense of fulfillment. That an elevated life need not be the entry into paradise or the kingdom of God. Because the best world could be here, but it's very hard to very frankly, I mean, how many Junzi are there really? As <laughs> Professor Zhang, he would be the first one to, to reject the notion that he's a Junzi. But yeah, so actually it's not a bad question. And it says, now, look, I've been teaching in the States forever, you know, it was like 35 years. And my mission there actually is to introduce essentially, not just Confucianism, you know, um, Chinese culture as a whole to, uh, to the American students. And many of them actually become quite, quite interested in what I have to say and offer. And why is that? Because it gives them another resource with which to think about life. Now, of course, in the States, whether they are particularly religious or not, they raised, you said to most of them in the Christian tradition, anyway, you know. So whenever they encounter any philosophical or religious tradition, they look at those things in terms of their understanding of Christianity, for instance. So why do many of them actually tend to be interested in, um, in Confucianism, Buddhism, Taoism, Greek? And that is because these are mental resources. 
These are spiritual resources that may complement their conception of what a good life is. Now, of course, most college students don't think along those lines. But when they hear about when they hear about this alternative notion of Qian, when they hear about the Tao, you know, some of them, of course, are quite enamored of uh, Taoism. Taoism re reminds them of the 60s, you know, the hippies, you know. <laughs> of course, it's sort of erroneous understanding. Anyway, the, 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 point, the point is that for those who are truly interested, they, they do find that a lot of other traditions offer a different view of life, which could be consoling, uh, if not ultimately fulfilling. So that's all. So, when you ask me, do I believe anything? Not really. <laughs> okay, thank you. And uh, uh, we are now five minutes uh, uh, to to five o'clock, so almost two hours. So I think I should uh, have the emphatic uh, feeling uh, following the teaching of Confucius that Professor Ng is really tired. So as the moderator, I have to say that we have to end the lecture today now. And thank you very much for all of you for your participation. And let me uh, ask you to join me to thanks uh, for Professor Ng's a very rich and inspirational. Thank you very much. And thank you for your show, your sympathetic concern for my <laughs> And that's Lee in action. <laughs> Well, thank you. Uh, and of course, you know, I suppose we'll linger on a little bit. You know, so, yes, please. Okay. 呃，就像郑辉教授刚才所说，今天的讲座已经圆满结束。然后谢谢吴安祖教授，谢谢呃郑作义教授，感谢各位参与。再次提醒大家，花一点时间，呃，填好问卷，并投进接待处的问卷收集箱。呃，呃，新亚书院，让填妥的出题纸，我进指定的收集箱，或者扫描屏幕上的二维码。That's the end of today's lecture. Thank you, Professor Ng and Professor Chung. And also thank you all for coming and uh, to join the lecture. Please be reminded to complete the questionnaire and drop it into the collection box over the reception counter. For new Asian students, please drop the questionnaire into the specified collection box. Okay. Okay. 李这李兆基楼四号演讲厅举行，讲题是比较视角下儒儒家金柱，西方诠释的相遇缺憾，也是以英语讲述，希望到时候再能见到大家。The second lecture will be held on the twenty ninth of October, four thirty p.m. A lecture theatre for Lei Xiu Kei, Li Xiao Kei Building, C U H K. The topic is. Chinese Confucian exegesis, Western humanistic theory, and Buddhist content of comparative thought. The lecture will be conducted in English. Hope to see you there. Thank you very much. Okay.